for the Thames Valley Breakup Club this evening. It's great to have you all with us. Um, and this after, uh, sorry, this evening, we're going to be talking about um, tips for self-care during divorce. So before we kind of get on to the topic and, and I introduce Rhiannon, just, just a few little bits of housekeeping. So the first thing to say is um, you'll see both a chat and a QA and a um, section. If you could, um, if possible, just pop your um, questions in the Q&A, just makes it a lot easier for us to get to them at the end. We can easily identify them. And the other thing just to say is that we will share rec um, this recording of this session with you all at the end. So you can go back and listen to it again. Um, so don't feel obliged to kind of scribble down notes and and, uh, and pressurise to do that. So um, my name is Amanda fritz Piles, and I'm um, a managing partner here at Stay Family Law and I cover the Thames Valley area. And I've been uh, practicing family law for uh, 14 years now. Um, and it's my specialism. And it's the only area of law I do. Um, and with me tonight also is um, Rhiannon Ford. And Rhiannon's a uh, divorce and separation consultant. And Rhiannon's got over 20 years experience in family law. And she previously worked as a solicitor before she then trained as a coach. So Rhiannon, I suppose a good place to start is, is asking us to, uh, is asking you, sorry, to, to tell us about your journey into, into becoming a divorce coach. Sure. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so I've been running my consultancy service for coming up to 13 years now. Um, but when I worked in private practice as a solicitor, specialising as, as you do in family law, I really recognised that there was much more that people needed support, help and guidance than just legal advice. So when you're going through relationship breakdown and deciding to get divorced or your partner has decided that they want to divorce, it affects every area of your life really to a certain extent and so it's really important and it was really important to me to make sure that everybody gets the right help and support so allocating somebody a solicitor obviously helps them with the legal side of things but there's so much more that that needs sort of help so that's where sort of hopefully I can come in and sort of act as a bit of a whether it's a project manager or facilitator to try and get the right resources and people in place but also providing that help and support in whatever way I can. So my work sort of complements the, the work that you do. Uh, yeah, uh, I think, you know, a, a, a big part of the work you do, um, Rhiannon, is, is, is supporting people with self-care as well as, you know, the practical elements of supporting someone through a divorce. So I suppose sort of kicking off on our topic tonight, um, I mean, how would you describe self-care and what, what is it, I suppose, is a good place to start? Yeah. It's a bit of a buzz phrase, isn't it? We're seeing it everywhere, really, in articles, on the, in the media. Everybody's talking about self-care. I think particularly during lockdown, it seemed to be everywhere. Everyone was talking about it. Um, and actually, yes, I think if we go back to basics, what is self-care? So self-care involves looking after our overall well-being. And that includes our mental health, our physical health, our emotional health. So it's all encompassing, really, about what, what makes up us as a person and how we need to look after ourselves to put ourselves in the best position possible. Mm. And, and why, why is that so important, Rhiannon, do you think, for people going through a divorce and, you know, I suppose just generally day-to-day -day life? Because obviously sure. it's a practice that, you know, we all need to we all need to have as part of our lives whether or not we're going through a divorce, I think, isn't it? Absolutely. I think when people are going through divorce and relationship breakdown, um, their, their buttons are being pressed in lots of different ways. So there's lots of um, emotional issues can come up. There's lots of decision making and worries and difficult thoughts and feelings that come up. So it's particularly important for people to be taking good care of themselves when they're going through a difficult time such as divorce to make sure they're putting themselves in the best position to be able to cope with the challenges that divorce and relationship breakdown can come, can, can, you know, come. So I think it's really important for people not to forget to look mm -hmm. after themselves when there's so much going on. I appreciate it. it can be the last thing on people's mind that they want to then think about self-care when they've got lots of things going on, but it's really important to, to make mm -hmm. that effort. It's an investment in ourselves. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and the people that take that time and make that investment, you know, I see the benefits of, of people that are, are considering those sort of really important elements of looking after themselves when they're going through a divorce and that they're able to be much calmer and clearer in the instructions they're giving their lawyers. But 
I mean, from your perspective, what, what would you say are, are the benefits of having good self-care and that self-care routine in place, Rhiannon? I think, I mean, as you said, you can see the benefits when you work with clients. I think from an individual perspective, we, if we're taking good care of ourselves, we're going to, our mood is going to be better. Mm. Um, we're going to be able to think more clearly. We're going to have clarity of thoughts. We're going to be able to focus better. We're going to be able to concentrate better. We're going to be able to sleep better. And all those things are crucial for all of us at any one time, but particularly when we're going through a challenging time like divorce. So you'll want to be making the best decisions for yourself in a divorce situation. So you'll want to have had plenty of sleep, um, regulating mood, having that concentration, not having brain fog, feeling perfectly rested as much as you can. So I think you know, a lot of the decisions in a divorce situation are quite life changing, aren't they? And, you know, you get one chance to make these decisions and get the right decisions for yourself. So you'll want to put yourself in, in the best position to, to do that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, kind of going back to what you said when we started, when I asked you, what is self-care? And I think from what you said, we can kind of break that down really into three elements, the physical aspects of self-care, the mental aspect and the emotional aspect of self-care so I, I kind of thought it might be helpful for us to sort of take those elements one by one and see what your thoughts are on each of them so in terms of your kind of tips for for physical self-care I mean I'm a big um I'm, I'm big into my fitness um and I, I love my running and my marathons and things so uh, for me exercise helps a lot to for me to process and and and, and clear my head. I mean, how can how do you think exercise can help with your self care routine during divorce? I think exercise can be brilliant, and I think it's often what people think about when they think about self care. Um, and it's 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 one of the easier ones to be able to do something about to add into our routine. But with all the different aspects of self care, it's different for everybody. So what is self-care to one person might be the last thing that they want to do. So just using you, sorry, Amanda, as your example, you're a big runner and you run lots of marathons. That would be my idea of health. (laughs) I'm very pleased. As it is for most sensible people. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But anyway, joking aside, obviously I've got huge admiration for what you do. I think it's fantastic. But the point is, it's an individual thing. So when, so if we take exercise, for example, absolutely, you know your go-to, you know that going out for a run and doing your training and doing all your fantastic marathons is going to help you with your physical health. And the knock-on effect of us helping with our physical health is it helps our mental health as well. So, but exercise can be lots of different things to lots of different people. So it doesn't have to be that you suddenly start running or you suddenly start joining a gym you may, that may be your idea of hell. It may be that you don't have enough time or money to be able to commit to joining a gym or doing a class. But it's, my advice is keep it simple. Think about what you need. So, you know, doing yoga, doing Pilates, going for a walk, taking Mm. the dog out for a walk is a big one for me. I've got a dog and that's great. I mean, they get you out every day because you've got to get them out every day. But getting out in that fresh air, Vitamin D, even if it's not a sunny day, just getting yourself moving is good. It really helps with mood. It helps with breathing. It helps with sleep. So even if it's as basic as walking every day, even for 15, 20 minutes, that's going to really benefit people. And then there are people who really enjoy exercise. I've got one client who was very into high energy fitness. So she used to do kickboxing. But during her divorce, she didn't have the energy to do that. She was being pulled in lots of different directions. She was tired. And so we had to talk about the fact that even that used to be her go to for exercise um, and getting that, you know, getting that hit. Well, literally kickboxing, I suppose, um, of endorphins. It didn't suit her for the moment. So the one thing I would say about exercise is work within your limits Think about what's achievable and realistic for you at this moment in time. You, you know, what you're doing now when you're feeling exhausted, when you're being stretched with all the different decisions and busyness that divorce and separation can bring, you may not be able to do what you used to be able to do, but it's only temporary. This is just for the moment to get you through. So exercise can be all sorts of things. 
It can be walking, swimming, yoga. It could be kickboxing. Another client of mine started doing something a bit more physical because she wanted to have that adrenaline rush because it took yeah. her out of her out of herself and you know she started to feel a little bit more relaxed so it's different for everybody really but exercise can be fantastic particularly getting outside yeah and I think it's so important isn't you say to be realistic and rather than set yourself unachievable goals that put more pressure on you that you know at Absolutely. time you may feel you failed already to add something yeah. else to that list it can yeah it's the last so, thing you need isn't it when you're already going through a challenging time yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. And I think um alongside exercise always comes nutrition, doesn't it? And and and, and food can be so well food is so important, making sure we're putting the right fuel in our bodies. Um would you say that's even more so during divorce? And and what should we kind of look be looking at as 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 how to fuel our bodies during that kind of challenge? Yeah, time? so um self-care. So when I talk to some clients about what they're doing about their self-care, um some people will think about oh well I make sure you know I allow myself that piece of chocolate cake and have a bubble bath and have an early night's sleep that's all fantastic but when we're going through a challenging time often the comforts that we gravitate towards aren't necessarily going to be helping our overall well-being so I'm certainly not and, and Amanda knows me well going to say you can't have chocolate and you can't have cakes that would be nonsense and everybody would say that you have lots of it which I do but the point is we've got to look at and think about what's going to help us overall so when it comes to food we have to be quite careful with what food and drink we have when we're going through a challenging time so that we don't make um, symptoms of stress and anxiety worse so the foods and drink that we've got to be quite careful with are things like sugar. So we've got to be a little bit careful about having too much sugar because we'll get that high, which will give us that buzz. But with that high, we'll then come back crash mm -hmm. afterwards. And that can then impact and sugar as well isn't good for sleep. So it's not going to be good. It's not good for memory um, and things like caffeine as well. So that can obviously affect sleep. So coffee, there's caffeine and chocolate, believe it or not, which I found out recently. Yeah, I didn't know that. Master. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we've got to be a little bit careful about caffeine. Now, if you're not sleeping well and you've got to get through your day, obviously you have that coffee in the morning, but just be careful you're not relying on caffeine all the way through the day. Mm -hmm. um, and alcohol as well. So a lot of people use as a comfort, oh, I, you know, I love having a glass of wine, watching a bit of Netflix, or having one in the bubble bath, you know, that would be my ideal of self-care. One glass, absolutely fine, but people need to be quite careful not to rely on alcohol as a crutch when mm. they're going through an emotionally challenging time, because it's actually a depressant. Mm. So it's going to end up making you feel worse. Mm. It's going to lower your mood. It's going to affect your sleep. You're not going to sleep soundly. Um, so we've always got to think of the long-term effect. So even though we get that that high hit when we have that caffeine or we have that chocolate, or we have that glass of wine or gin and tonic. We've just got to be careful. It's all about moderation. So those mm. are the things, obviously that's the downside. So the fun bits and pieces of what we like to eat and drink, we've probably got to be a little bit careful of. Um, and then the positive. So what we need to probably bring into, because I don't want it all to be about what we've got to no. do to <laughs> ourselves and you know, lose all the fun stuff. The foods that are good when we go through difficult times are things that are going to stabilize our mood and our energy levels. So protein is great. Uh, so good protein. So chicken, um, white fish, tuna, salmon, those sorts of things, because they're going to keep our energy going. They also help with brain function. Um, herbal teas are good. So green tea, there is a bit of caffeine in that, but it's better than coffee. They help with concentration, focus, that sort of thing. Um, and then all the more obvious healthy foods like green leafy veg can help be a mood stabilizer. Um, and nuts and seeds can help with cognitive function. So just eating or making a little bit of an effort when we're going through a difficult time. And I do appreciate when we're going through a difficult time, we're going to want to gravitate towards things that make us instantly feel better. And that may not be spinach. But it's yeah. worth thinking about little stim simple steps we can do just to make things that little bit better for us. 
Even mm -hmm. you're supposed to have the spinach and then have your chocolate as a dessert. I don't, I'm not a nutritionist, but it's all about <laughs> balance, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Having yeah. food and drink is a difficult one. If if that's how you, I, I use chocolate as a crutch. I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. so I find that quite difficult to. But I know that I won't sleep well. I know mm -hmm. that I'll feel dreadful and have that crash and get headaches because I eat that much. Um, so it can be difficult, I think. And again, I think it's about setting realistic expectations, isn't Absolutely, it? And, yeah. and um, you know, I suppose not having forbidden food because it makes it all the more attractive, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it can be <laughs> yeah. a treat. It can be yeah. something to look forward to, can't it? Exactly. So, exactly. yeah, and I think we in, will enjoy it more then rather than it becoming a habit. Because mm. um, if we overindulge, it then becomes a habit. And then the danger is that it's actually not doing us any good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And... Um, you know, we've, we've touched on sleep. A lot of people struggle with sleep at the best of times, let alone when they're going through a you know difficult thing like a separation or a divorce. I mean, what would you what, what what would you say would be things to focus on in order to improve sleep quality or things that could help there yeah, with your self care routine? Yeah, I agree. Sleep can be a really difficult one because our when you're going through a, a challenging time like divorce, your mind is probably whizzing around with lots of thoughts about different things and. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can then be really difficult to switch off when it comes to nighttime. So uh, in actual fact, I think there's two parts to it would be um, my advice. There's thinking about what you can do in the day, funnily enough. Um, and then there's what you can do in the evening. So our sort of, um, it's now being referred to as like sleep hygiene. Okay. So these in the evening, you know, making sure that you're ready for bed. Now, I know that sounds a bit bonkers, but, you know, turning off electrical devices at least half an hour, if not an hour before you go to bed, don't take your mobile phone to bed and start scrolling um, or looking at emails yeah. or, or whatever. Um, and it's not just because you're using your mind, but also the light that comes from mm -hmm. these electrical devices. So turning off electrical devices, making sure your bedroom is ready for sleep. So making sure you haven't got work or, I don't know, documents from your solicitor on your bed or whatever. Make it a peaceful place to be yeah. curtains properly closed. Get into a routine of going to bed at the same time, getting up at the same time, even if you're not sleeping well, just to get your body clock into that routine. Um, making sure your room is quiet. So in the night time, a lot of us know these sorts of things, you know, we're not supposed to take our mobile phone to bed and that sort of thing. But it's worth remembering to and, and actually knowing the positives of not doing those things, because we can get into a routine and think it's not really bothering me. It's not if that's not the problem. But once you take out those bad habits, it's amazing how you can improve your sleep and then in the daytime as well. So if you haven't slept well at night, if you're able to, and I appreciate this isn't necessarily easy for a lot of people, but having a rest in the day mm -hmm. to make up for the fact you haven't slept that well at night. So whether it's a nana nap, you know, it's actually going and having a sleep. If you're one of those people, those lucky people, I can't do that, unfortunately, you can actually go to sleep in the day. So you're getting your hours in, it may not be all at night, but you're making sure you're getting that rest or even if it's just having a rest. So lying down or sitting down with your eyes closed, doing some deep breathing, and you can time it on your mobile. So some of my clients say to me, when I talk about the importance of rest is, oh, well, you know, I wouldn't want to fall asleep because what if I forget to pick the kids up from school? Mm -hmm. um, or I've got a work meeting and I don't want to go over my lunch hour break. Um, well, just set an alarm on your mobile phone. Just keep it as simple as that. And we're not talking about an hour or two hours. It could be 10 minutes. It could be a power nap. And even if you're not going to sleep, if you're resting and resting doesn't involve watching the TV or playing on your phone, it means lying down or sitting down comfortably with your eyes closed and just doing slow, deep breathing. Even 10 minutes can make quite a difference. It's time to yourself. So mm -hmm. having that... Knowing that you and, and understanding that you need to rest and taking that rest where you can, whether it's in the day or doing what you can to improve your sleep at night, I think can make quite a difference. Yeah. We all yeah. know what it's like when you've had a bad night's sleep. You just don't oh, come yeah. in the day. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and breathing, I mean, it's such a simple thing, but it can make a huge difference, can't it, Rianne? Just to take yeah. these 10 minutes that, like you were saying, to do some 
some um, breathing exercises. I mean, how does that explain to us how that kind of helps, Rhiannon? I mean, what what can that what can that sort of manifest? Sure. Breathing is so important and we just take it for granted and we just think well, we just breathe automatically so it's all fine because we're still alive and oxygen's going yeah. in. But the but the type of breathing we do can make a real difference on our overall well-being, mentally, physically and emotionally. Yeah. Um, and what I find a lot is because I, I try and read um, clients' body language when I'm working with them so that I can see how they're feeling about what they're saying. And often one of the things that I notice if a client is feeling anxious is their breathing is very shallow. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes they even do little gasps. I don't mean that they can't catch their breath, but there's like their, their breath is quite shallow and they're trying to talk to explain something to me. And the danger with all of us, if we're breathing too shallowly, is that a word? I'm going with it, yeah. um, is that there's just too much to carbon dioxide going in. And so it's going to affect our thinking. It's going to affect, it might even make us giddy. It can create heart palpitations. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to feel a little bit uncomfortable and panicky and not be able to focus very well. So even very simplistic, I mean, obviously there's meditation, there's breathing exercises, there's loads of things that people can look up on the internet. But the simple thing of just taking time and pausing and slowing down your breathing. And the idea is that you take, that you're conscious of your breath and you take long, slow breaths and your out breath is longer than your in breath. Right. And even if you just do that for even five minutes, it will calm your nervous system down. So you will feel physically calmer and if you feel physically calmer, you will feel mentally calmer. Mm. The other good thing about concentrating on breathing is it distracts your mind. So with all those thoughts that are whizzing around for all of us, and particularly someone going through divorce and separation with all the you know, logistics and decisions that have got to be made, if you just focus on your breath for five minutes, it can actually do wonders. And everybody's got five minutes to spare. Yeah, Everybody, you know, whether it's you take less time to watch that film you're going to watch or you make sure you have enough time in a, in a lunch break or even for parents picking up the kids. If you're in the car, arrive at the school gates that little bit early and just sit in the car. Mm. Nobody needs to know what you're doing. No, no. Just taking that pause can make quite a difference. Mm. And we can control our breathing, can't we? And I imagine Absolutely. when you when you have that feeling of getting your breathing under control, it makes you just feel more in control of things generally. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I think the next sort of, um, if you like, arm of self care we talked about was, was mental health self care. Um, yeah. yeah. And I mean, what what do you think the most important things are that you can do to look after your mental health in the divorce? I think looking after your physical health has a knock on effect in looking after your mental health. So if you feel better physically, so if you're sleeping better and you're eating better and you're doing exercise and getting out and getting fresh air every day, it can help your mental health enormously. Uh, and we all know from the from the pandemic that, you know, getting that hour out of the house and beginning stages um, uh, that Boris Johnson allowed us to have that one hour, first of all, it made such a difference to people to be outside. So I think looking after our physical health can make a big difference. Mm. I think compartmentalizing as much as you can can make a big difference. And what I mean by that is not letting your divorce take over your whole day, 24 yeah. seven. So allowing yourself to have time to think about your divorce situation and what you need to sort out, but limiting it. So even if it's, I'm going to allow myself to think about my divorce between 1 and 2 p.m. today, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. And I know that might sound a bit bonkers, but actually taking control of the controllables is really important when we're feeling a little bit uncertain about what the future holds and what's going to transpire in the divorce process. So try and have time off from the divorce. Compartmentalise your thinking, compartmentalise your day. So it's not all encompassing. Yeah. Um, and then the lap over, I think, between looking after our mental health and looking after our emotional health. 
I think for both, it's having a strong support system in place. Mm -hmm. So having the right people and the right resources to turn to, to help us when we're feeling those uncomfortable feelings or we're having those unhelpful thoughts. I think that can make a real difference as well, because we can have, there's loads of unhelpful thinking that can come. Yeah. I mean, what, what, I mean, what do you think? I mean, I, I, I'm a typical overthinker. I think a lot of people are. Yeah. Um, I mean, what kind of, how will people know that they're doing that, do you think? Yeah. I mean, how, how do you identify that? I think, I think, uh, as you say, a lot of people who are overthinkers prior to their divorce probably know that they are. Mm. I think you need to take time to recognise it. So whether that's that you spend some time deciding look I've been thinking about this thing and this thought is getting bigger and bigger and I'm not doing anything about it and I'm starting to get anxious so there's different types of unhelpful thinking that can be associated with overthinking so there can be things like catastrophizing so thinking everything's going to be the worst case scenario that it could ever be that can be very uncomfortable and we start to think about worst case scenarios there can be black and white thinking where we automatically then with our overthinking think it's going to be this or it's going to be the polar opposite and life is normally somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, there can be overgeneralizing. So presuming things are going to be a certain way. So you're guessing what the future holds. You don't necessarily know that that's the reality. So you need to check in with yourself on that. Um, so I think for a lot of it, so going back to your question, I think when will you know you're overthinking, when you're not moving forward with making your decisions and or you're starting to feel anxious about a particular thought. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point, it's a good idea to take a pause and break it down. Am I overthinking? Am I being realistic with what my expectations are? And then reaching out to get help with it, whether it's talking to somebody such as yourself you know, talking to your uh, your divorce solicitor to find out whether what that person been overthinking is actually right, whether it's mm. working with somebody such as myself, whether it's working with a therapist. So getting answers to those questions that are causing that overthinking, I think can make quite a difference as well for people. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like that comes back to kind of one of the ways to help with that is, is, is creating your own support network and... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how, how how do you, what do you think that looks like for people? Because that, I think there, you know, I certainly find with my clients, there are those that give them constructive support in the process and those yeah. that perhaps don't give them um, Absolutely. constructive support. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Rhiannon? What does a constructive support network look like? I agree with you. I think having a support system in place is is crucial. We're going through a challenging time, but it's got to be the right support. It's got to be the right support from the right people and the right resources, because if it's not, it can be the wrong support and that can have catastrophic consequences. So obviously looking at the professionals that can help is going to be an, e an easier option. So knowing if you need legal advice, you talk to a family law specialist solicitor. If you need financial advice, you talk to a, a financial advisor. Um, if you need sort of more practical or personal support, you talk to somebody such as myself, a divorce mm. consultant or coach. Friends and family, as you say, can be a great support, but it's important to choose the right people to provide the right support. And that can change and be quite different for people when they're going through divorce, strangely enough. So, you know, your best friend since you were four, who you share everything with, may not provide the best support when you're going through a divorce, they may be opinionated and say, well, oh, well, I never liked her or him anyway, or, or mm. I wouldn't do it like that. Or, you know, I read that you've got to do it this way. So it may be a matter of taking a bit of a step back. So my advice on that is choose your circle of trust very carefully. Choose who you confide in very carefully and actually keep that circle of trust fairly small. Because the mm. other danger about telling too many people about what's going on for you is you've got lots of people then to yeah. update and lots of people then that can ask you questions when you might be actually taking your time off and doing your self-care or that you're opening yourself up to lots of opportunity of opinions and they are opinions and everybody becomes a, an expert in their own divorce so you know gravitating towards other people who've been through a divorce 
can be helpful in some ways, but actually can be very negative in other ways. They're an expert in their own divorce. Mm -hmm. They actually don't know all the connotations of how the law works or all the different options that might be available for you in your situation. So I think getting the right support is really important. And if anything, start small. So, yeah. you know, if you're worried about um, confiding in someone, they're probably not the person to confide in. Mm. So it's just being really careful. And if you can't talk to friends and family, do seek out help from somebody such as myself. You know, quite a few of my clients say, I don't want to talk to friends and family, but I needed somebody that understood and a safe place for me to talk through what I'm thinking and feeling. And that's what we're here for. So do reach out. There are resources and people out there that, you know, we specialise, both of us in this area. Yeah. And we're there to help. And also the great thing about someone like you, Rhiannon, is, is it objective support? You know? Yes, I think that's um, so important, isn't it? You yeah. want to have something, somebody independent, but that gets it and yeah. not going to be opinionated or um, swayed in any particular direction. I mean, the other thing that's not helpful is when you have a friend who's egging you on to be angry towards your ex and you know, oh, you've got to take him or her for everything they've got. That may feel like, oh, I've got great support in that person, but that's not actually helping you. That's yeah. not how the legal process works in family law. And actually, it's just going to heighten your stress levels. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, getting the right people in place. And as you say, somebody who's completely impartial, I think, can, you know, can make quite a positive difference. Absolutely. Yeah. And someone that's not going to put you on an aggressive confrontational part as well oh, absolutely um because if there's one thing that's going to harm your ability to care for yourself in a divorce it, it's it's being faced with all those sort of negative feelings and negative communications every day isn't it yeah. absolutely you want to put yourself in the best position possible to yeah. be able to manage these life changes yeah. and these decisions that you're going to be faced with making and this is all around sort of self-care so having that support system in place so self-care is different for everybody. It mm. can be having a bubble bath. It can be going for a run. It can be having that piece of chocolate cake. It can be sitting in a coffee shop with one close friend or relative that you know mm. you're going to feel safe with and you're going to enjoy spending time with. It can be lots of things for different people. And it's recognizing what we need as individuals at any one time. And what we used to enjoy might be different at the moment. So it's working out what works best for us and making sure we can put that in place for ourselves and keeping it simple really yeah and is that what you would say in terms of you know where do you start in terms of creating a self-care practice yeah and it's obviously simplicity is yeah. a good one to start with I think so keep it simple because I think when you're being stretched in all different directions with going through divorce and separation you know you're not necessarily going to have plenty of time to suddenly think right what am I going to do? Right. This is my whole sort of week's plan. And you, I've got lots of spare time. It doesn't necessarily work like that. So keeping it really simple, you want it to be achievable. So keeping it simple and straightforward and achievable is going to make quite a difference for you. And thinking for yourself, what do I need? What does self-care mean to me mm -hmm. rather than what appeals to somebody else? Yeah. Because um, that everybody's different. So I think that can be really helpful. And doing something every day towards, if we can, each element. So something that's, I mean, there might be some things like exercise can help with mental health, physical health and emotional health. But doing something every day, however small it is, even if it's that 15 minutes pause and deep breathing, something every day so that you can build up a routine, because I think that can be um good so then when we've got that established it becomes quite natural to us and we can mm. go in with it um if you've already got a, a, a self-care practice in place fantastic if you already practice yoga for example brilliant carry on doing that but for some people they've lost those routines because mm. things have just got in the way for whatever reason so go back to what you know you benefit from and who you benefit from so whether it's you doing something the other big thing actually that comes to mind is, so we've been talking about things you can do. There's also, I think, you've got to think about what can I decide not to do that could help my self-care? So actually a big thing, actually it's just reminds me, something came up with a client earlier on today, and actually self-care for her is saying no. 
Right, yes, yeah, that's yeah, a big one, isn't it? Yeah. She was over committing herself on. Mm. Um, or that she actually didn't need to do at the moment mm. um, or wasn't important. And I think we're not, a lot of us are not very good at saying no. Yeah. We just keep going, don't we? And then we, the danger is we burn out. And we're no yeah. good to anybody if we don't look after ourselves first. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you can't pour from an empty cup. I love that phrase. It's and also the big one of, you, can't, you know, you've got to put your own oxygen mask on first before you can help somebody else. So, yeah. Yes, I'm all about prioritizing yourself in the sense of you've got to have self-care and self-compassion. But if it helps some people, because they're like, well, it feels self-indulgent or it feels selfish for me to think about self-care. It's not self-indulgent. It's not selfish. It's it's self-care. It's it's necessary for all of us. And we can then give to other people in whatever way we need to. So, yeah, I think it's I really like the oxygen mask. Analogy. Yeah, it's a great it analogy, well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I think as well, I think a routine, again, in a time when life feels like it's out of control, can also be a very comforting thing to have, isn't it? That looks absolutely sort of st- stabilizing um influence in your life. Yeah. But, but I suppose there are gonna be times, aren't there, when it becomes really difficult to to maintain that routine. And what what would you what would you say to people during during those sort of hard times? you know how how do, how can they not let self-care completely you know disappear out the back window yeah I think for me the big uh my sort of tagline <laughs> that all my clients giggle about is that I always say be kind to yourself yeah so you know this is self-care and so it's got to be caring for yourself mm-hmm. so it shouldn't be anything that's too much for you so I think it's taking things step by step um and taking keeping it simple small changes can make a big difference so you know things that we can fit into our day quite easily so whether that's because they only take a little bit of time or whether it's because something comes naturally to us it might be worth gravitating towards that as starting your self-care practice but it is difficult maintaining self-care during Mm. difficult times you're being pulled in lots of difficult directions you know mentally all the decisions that you're having to make um, can be difficult you're not going to be feeling your best physically you're going to be tired and that can have a knock-on effect with your immune system a lot of my clients end up getting quite a few colds and things Mm. like that um, when they're going through their divorce um, and you know the stress and anxiety so it's keeping it simple for yourself and deciding what you need to do and when and actually if it's well I don't want to do anything for the moment then that's your self-care. Your mm. self-care is I'm going to bed early or I'm not going to do that. So saying no is a good one. Mm. Um, and actually just being kind to yourself and know that actually it doesn't have to be anything complicated. It's just mm. something that works for you as an individual. It's going to help you feel better, whether it's happier, calmer, more relaxed, anything that you think could help you individually um, and it's doing what you can to in, in your own way as an individual yeah. to make that happen. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And I suppose, you know, I think a lot of people struggle with getting through the work day and not letting kind of divorce invade invade that. Um, yeah. Quite often happens, I think. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people find that very tough to be able to focus on work, but also kind of to be able to deal with um I'm gonna call it divorce men, <laughs> divorce yeah. admin, because there is a lot of it. Um and what would you what would you, what would you say about that, Rihanna? And how, how would you say people can help balance that? I think that's a big um issue for a lot of people, isn't it? Mm. So um and and also a communication with solicitors, mediators is is often you know, it's mostly done on email, isn't it? Yeah. So if you're uh, if you're at your desk and you're wherever you work in an office or you work from home, you're on your computer, and it's very easy then, of course, to see your inbox filling up and think, oh, I've got to jump on that email straight away, and I've got mm-hmm. to answer straight away. The big thing I think about the workday, my sort of top tips would be to, as we were talking about with helping with mental health, actually, is to compartmentalize mm-hmm. and actually think when am I going to allow myself time to look at the emails from my solicitor or my divorce consultant and not let it impinge on 
you know, because you'll still have work to do. So you've got people have deadlines with their, their office jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not letting it, letting the divorce take over completely. So it's deciding when you're going to look at those messages or whether it's that you put your phone on silent so that your other co-parent can't be bombarding you on WhatsApp with messages about where's the swimming kit, you forgot to put it in the sports bag, da 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 So we're actually giving yourself I suppose taking control of where you can take control mm-hmm. of and, and your time, we actually have more control over what we choose to use our time than we perhaps think. So you never have to jump on an email, sorry, Amanda, that a yeah. sister has sent you. Well, no, in I, that I was actually about to say to you, Rhiannon, you know, in, you know, I prefer people to take the time to properly read and digest yeah. what I'm saying to her, what I'm saying to them, because I think, very often um, with email, the pace it is, it's instant communication and people are pinging things backwards and forwards. But quite often, you know, those aren't the clearest instructions, things are missed, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, we have to go back and clarify things. So not only is it is it good to take the time from um, a self-care perspective and deal with that when you're ready to deal with it, but also to be blunt from a legal cost perspective, if you're considering the advice you're being given carefully and responding in the way that we need you to with all the points we need to cover then it is one of the easiest ways that you can manage your own legal costs that's a really good piece of Mm. advice and I think I I, and I think that's the danger with technology isn't it we can be contacted on so many different platforms yeah 24 7 and I think that tends to then speed us all up we Mm. think we've got to do everything at 100 miles an hour and things have got to be done yesterday and I think you're totally right from a from the legal perspective, as well as the self care, if you're doing things too fast, you're not giving yourself time to digest and process things, that's going to cause stress and anxiety, you could quickly send a response off to your solicitor, and then five minutes later, think of something else that you think, oh, actually, I think yeah. differently now, and then you've got to send another email. And as you say, that's not helpful for the solicitor, they will want calm and considered responses to their emails. So I think mm-hmm. in a work day, Closing down or switching off notifications on your phone and other devices, having your email perhaps even switched off for certain periods Mm -hmm. of the day so you can focus on, you know, the work that you're going to be doing Um, and just sort of allowing yourself that time away from the divorce, I think. Um, And when I say divorce, I don't just mean the legal side of things, but I do mean the parenting issues and all the other personal issues that have kind of come up on WhatsApp and Messenger and, you know, with the other parent and that sort of thing, giving yourself time. So, you know, a lot of parents think, well, I've got to always have my phone on in case anything happened with one of the kids. Absolutely. But you can still control the fact that you can put it on silent yeah, or that you can, you know, there are different things you can do to take back a little bit of control. Um, So I think in your work day, um, I think take control of the controllables and be careful how you use your time. Yeah, and I always, I always say to uh, to my to my team when they're trying to get through some work or whatever, if it's that urgent, so they'll find a way to contact you. And I think that's true. <laughs> <It's> so <laughs> true, true most scenarios, if someone needs to get hold of you that desperately, they will find a way to. So mm. yeah, um, I think we've got a, f- a couple of minutes just to. Um, have a have a little bit of a chat about um how important self-care can be particularly when you're going through the menopause and divorce at the same time um because obviously you're dealing with 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 issues related to both do you want to just um it's coming up more and more actually um and it's such an important topic it could probably be a session on, on, on its own really and it was always such a taboo topic I mean even my mum I tried asking my mum you know how is your menopause and she looked at me in absolute horror yeah talk about things like that um and it's such a shame I mean I think uh, there are lots there are plenty of celebrity uh, menopause advocates out there that have made it much more streamlined uh, much more mainstream yeah. so you know the likes of Davina McCall she talks about it all the time that there's lots of books out so I think people are becoming more comfortable talking about it Um, But it's really important and very topical, actually, with quite a few of my clients that I'm working with at the moment, when you're going through a divorce. Mm -hmm. And the latest statistics tell us that something like 60% of divorces 
are filed by women in their 40s, 50s and 60s. So those are all women who are going through the menopause. Mm. So, and, and when we think about the fact that that's a high statistic, but 51% of the population are women, this is something that's really important. And one of the things, um, and I've got a blog if anybody's interested in getting some more information about this, but the big thing that can come up for people and I've, that I've seen recently is a lot of what people are describing as divorce symptoms are okay. very similar, if not the same, as their perimenopausal symptoms. So I'm not suggesting it's one over the other. What I want to get out to people is that if you are a woman in your 40s, 50s and 60s going through divorce, you have an added um, mm. complication. I don't, it's difficult mm. to know what's the right word to use, really. Um, with what you're going through because you mm. are going through all these changes in your body not voluntarily mm. and some mm. people can really suffer you yeah. know some people have a really tough time of not sleeping at all anxiety mood swings emotional outbursts yeah. brain fog depression I mean yeah. and also it can affect so many parts of the physical body um, so it, it's and also it doesn't just affect the woman it will affect their partner it will mm. affect their children in if they're feeling differently and behaving differently through no fault of their own. Of course, it's going to have a knock on effect on all our relationships around us. So um, I do talk to and I'm quite open about it with clients. Mm. Obviously, I've got to be quite careful how I tread in case they're like my mum. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's so important to think, you know, you, you're going to be having a tough time. There may yeah. be other reasons why you're not sleeping and that you've got brain fog and that you lose words when you're speaking. Yes, of course, it, it, it could be stress about the divorce, but have you thought about whether it's perimenopausal symptoms? Is it worth talking to your GP? Is it worth doing the questionnaire that they do to see if you, you know, you do, you are going through the perimenopause? Is it worth talking to them if you are about HRT treatments? And I know obviously mm -hmm. lots of people have got different views about um, mm -hmm. things like that. And I suppose where I come from is it is all about self-care because we want to do our best for ourselves. And actually that can involve your men looking after your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health. But for women going through the menopause and, peri and struggling with perimenopausal symptoms, it's really important that, that they, you know, we don't make it harder for ourselves than we need to. Know that there's help out there. Go and get some advice. See if there's things that could help because it is a double whammy. Yeah. Brain fog, with, uh, brain fog's a big one for people um, as a perimenopausal symptom. And of course the knock-on effect in a divorce is you're not gonna be thinking clearly. You're gonna have trouble making decisions. You're gonna have trouble focusing, concentrating. Um, people have low self-esteem uh, through perimenopause often. And that can then have a knock-on effect where they're not feeling strong about their own decision-making. Their yeah. self-esteem has taken a hit, so they might not make the best decisions for themselves in the divorce case. So it's a it's a big, big topic, um, and something very close to my heart at the moment. Mm. But I just what you know for ladies out there, or even the husbands of the ladies, do be aware of this. Don't shy away from learning about yeah. this and yeah. see if there's any help that you know that that person can get to make life that bit easier. I think why struggle when we don't have to. Well, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I think that's kind of brought to the end of the topics we were going to cover um, tonight, hasn't it, um, Bjorn? So, Kate, do you want to? Hi. Sorry. Yeah, there is one question in the Q and A. Yeah. Okay. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. You've got that. Okay. So, um, my occupational health advisor at work has advised me that I am. Um, so advice that I take some time off a of sick leave due to my mental health and the stress I'm under due to my separation. Would you recommend I could, sorry, what, what would you recommend I can do as wellness so that I'm proactive whilst I'm at work, off work? That's a good question, Rhiannon. So kind of using time yeah. constructively. Um, I think it depends on what self-care looks like to that person. So what do they enjoy doing? Um, and making sure they're allowing time for that. So if they enjoy walking, taking the dog for a walk, sitting and cuddling the dog, 
or they enjoy yoga or they enjoy going to the gym. So it's it's having a think about what would be comfortable in bringing into that self-care practice. And it depends on the individual needs of the person mm -hmm. involved. So if, for example, they're needing time off because their sleep has been very poor and so they've been struggling then with focus at work, for example, then think about well, what can I do to improve my sleep hygiene and thinking about different ways. So it, it will probably depend on the particular situation of the individual and having a think about what does self-care mean to them? What's missing in what their life looks like at the moment that they could add in as a positive or what could they take out? Yeah. Whether it's chocolate, that second gin and tonic, or whether it's not saying yes to everybody. Yeah. It can be as simple as that. So it's having a think about you know how much time are you going to have off what does that involve what does that look like obviously working out what you need to do in that time because there are going to be things that are non-negotiable as there are in real life but only doing things that you need to do yeah so letting go of things you don't really need to do and sometimes that takes some thinking because sometimes we just think well I've got to do everything because I always have but actually if you're going to take that time off and you're going to invest it in your health Think about what you need to be doing and let go of things you don't need to be doing, whether it's that you ditch them, the three D's, whether it's that you ditch them, whether it's that you delegate them or whether it's that you do them. But mm. be careful, only work within your limits for the moment and know you're taking that time off because you need to. And that might yeah. and that will probably mean doing a lot less than you would normally do in a day because you need yeah. that rest. Hopefully yeah. That's helpful. I think, uh, yeah. And it's, it's important not to feel pressure just to fill that time just because Absolutely. you're on work isn't yeah. it so, it's uncomfortable it can be uncomfortable to say yeah. stop and mm. it may take a few days to adjust to slow down and you'll and I would advise doing it slowly yeah so not just expecting right well I'm not going to get up till midday and then all I'm going to do is you know one thing it's it's important to sort of pace yourself even when it's slowing down yeah it might take a little time to get into that sort of slower rhythm it'd be great to see that this person's employers have acknowledged that fantastic for her, for her at this time that's really lovely to see yeah yeah um i mean in terms of we've talked about saying no haven't we Rihanna? And, and and i mean how do you in three d's might actually feed into this in terms of helping people to set boundaries and not say yes to everyone um the 3D sounds like a good place to start with that, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's a tricky one because if we're a people pleaser, which a lot of us are, our, mm. our MO is just to simply say yes, we don't even think about saying no, but actually what we've got to do is, is prioritise ourselves at the moment. If we're, if, if we're depleted and our resilience is low, it's harder to say no, but mm. it's more important than ever because we just don't have the capacity we don't have the capacity to be able to do everything and be there for everybody you're going to we're going to have been stretched in lots of different di um, directions when we've been going through a difficult time so we've got to pull back and we've got to do less it's only temporary but we've got to do less and it goes back to the you can't pour from an empty cup you're no good to that other person by saying yes to helping them move house for example I don't know on Saturday, when you are emotionally drained and physically exhausted and mm. have a million other things to do that are actually more important to yourself. And it doesn't make you selfish and you can do it in a kind way. So there are mm. lots of different ways in which, you know, depending what somebody's asking you to do, have a think, don't say yes straight away is the big thing. If mm. somebody asks you for a favor or something comes up, even if it's a work project, don't reply straight away. Give yourself time to decide, do I have capacity for this? Do I have capacity for this now? Mm. Could I recommend that they use somebody else instead? Does it have to be done now? Do I just simply need to say, I'm really sorry, but I don't have capacity for this at the moment. I'd love to help with this another time. Hope you find somebody to help with this, depending what it is. So giving space before answering can be good. One of my friends, although she's a bit sort of hardcore, says no to everything, first of all, and then has to think about it and then decides whether she's going to. Yeah. I don't think I could do that. That'd be no. extreme. But 
giving yourself some space before you reply. So if somebody's asked you on a text message, don't reply straight away. If somebody's asked you on an email, or if somebody asks you face to face, this is why we say to my clients, if your ex comes to you and asks you something, say, oh, right, that's interesting. Let me have a think about that and I'll get back to you. Because you're not letting them down by saying no when it's beyond your capacity. No, exactly. Um, you've got, we've got to start prioritizing ourselves. It's not to the cost of other people, it's the opposite, mm. actually. We're mm. putting on that oxygen mask first. Mm. But when, you're, when we're depleted, we've got to say no, probably more than yes, just because we just don't have anything left to give. The tank mm. is empty. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really important to recognize that. Like, it's yeah. hard to practice saying no, but start with mm. easy things, I always think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it becomes a little bit more. I don't know more more what we're more comfortable I suppose yes I think yeah I think you're right yeah yeah yeah. sure okay I don't think we had any more questions tonight so um I just want to finish off by saying thank you so much to everyone for for coming and, and thank you a special thank you to Rhiannon for joining us and imparting us with all her fabulous knowledge on on self care um, and I think Rhiannon is a great person to have on your support team um, for that sort of objective um, support and advice. Um, so thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye -bye. Thanks, Amanda. Bye, everybody.